Such a great song. How you doing there? Oh, I'm, I'm doing great, and now a whole lot better getting to hear the beautiful guitar work of the legendary Louis Shelton. Thank you so much, Louis, for joining me today uh, in a completely different part of the world in a different time zone all the way on the Gold Coast in Australia. I'm so glad you agreed to allow me to interview you in this fashion. Yeah, it's amazing that we can do it, you know? Well... Man, I am just so grateful to be sitting here with you and getting to firstly hear you play the amazing Jackson 5 song, I Want You Back. Uh, I have a lot of questions to ask you about this song and this session. Do you remember what equipment that you used to record that iconic guitar hook and that iconic guitar part for that song? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I used my little Princeton uh-huh. Uh, that I still have. That's what I'm playing through right now. Uh -huh. It's the only one I ever turn on in my studio. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure which guitar I played because I had, at the time, a few different guitars. Uh, mo my main one is in the Musicians Hall of Fame, so I don't have that one here. That was a okay. Strat. Uh, uh, but it could have possibly been a telly okay. like this. One of those two. Okay, so some sort of single coil. We can we know that. At yes. Least. Yes. And then, uh -huh. it, and typically, when you would use a, a a Princeton reverb, and this seems to be a, a common theme amongst many of the session musicians that we've interviewed, it was it was a silver face version. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, okay, and and in probably a later '60s because I would it's it, I think that that I want you back was released in the late '60s, like '68, '69, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was probably '69. Okay. okay. Yeah. And did you typically use reverb on the amp, or did you always turn that off and just kind of use the other controls of the amplifier? Well, I had my my amp modified. I didn't have a reverb on it. Oh. <laughs> uh, I had the Paul Rivera mod, so I had a a master volume. Okay. So that I could crank crank the preamp and get a little bit of dirt on it. Man. But not have it so loud that it was bleeding through right. all of the other microphones in the room. And did you kind of have like a strategy on how you'd kind of set your amp or would it really vary from session to session around kind of how much gain you would you would kind of get from the amplifier? Yeah. Um I mean I would I would adjust it according to what the song called for. Right. You know, if it was a clean uh, a song that required a clean sound, obviously I wouldn't I wouldn't have any dirt in that. But I could crank it all the way up to, uh, you know, pseudo heavy metal kind of stuff. I will, if I want, you know, Carlos Santana kind of feedback. Yeah. And sustain. Yeah. Um, oh man, it's it's so amazing. And, and speaking of another Jackson Five song that you played on, because uh, you seem to be the go-to guy for a lot of their biggest hits, for the song ABC, did you also use a similar uh, gear pairing like the Princeton Reverb in your Strat or your Telly, or do you remember what might have been used on that song? I remember uh, going uh, into a direct box because Motown didn't like to record the uh. amp. They like you to plug into a, a direct box. And that was back when we didn't have many foot pedals. Right. Uh, probably I only had a, a wah-wah pedal and a fuzz uh, pedal yeah. of some sort. And and I had like one of the first Roland uh, fuzz pedals or distortion pedals. And I plugged that straight into a direct box for the ABC. And uh, and that was that was just the fuzz was producing all the gain on that one. Yeah, yes. And do you and do you remember if that was a strat or a telly that you used on that or was it something else altogether? Oh, uh, again it would have been one of those two. It's okay. just 
uh, it's so far back there, I can't remember exactly what guitar I had in my hands at the time. No, I, I completely get that. We're asking you to go all the way back to 1970 in this case. So I can appreciate that it may not be fresh in your in your memory. And you were playing presumably hundreds or thousands of sessions every year. You were so such a busy, busy guy in that time. So I can completely understand. Would you have any objections to maybe playing a little bit of the, the part that you had come up with on uh, ABC for us? Um, I'll see if I can remember it. We'll get right back to the interview with Louie, but before we do, I want to take a quick break to talk about one of the sponsors that makes these interviews possible. That's Sweetwater and their program, The Gear Exchange. Sweetwater Gear Exchange is a great way for you to be able to buy and sell used gear, very much the same way that you would on other third-party platforms, except the cool thing about Sweetwater's Gear Exchange is that they don't charge any seller fees so long as you take all of your earnings and put them on a Sweetwater gift card. And if you're somebody like me that's always buying and selling gear, it's a great way to ensure that you're not just giving away extra percentages of your earnings just into the ether and that you actually get to keep it and use it and apply it towards something that you actually want. So check out the gear exchange over at sweetwater.com slash used. You can start an account for free, start buying and start selling. Now back to the interview with Louis. I love it. I love it. What were you using right there for the fuzz tone? Uh, Big Muff. Oh, perfect. Well, it seemed to nail it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. so that was a Roland uh, fuzz unit. It's like a Japanese fuzz unit. Yeah. One of the first ones that came out. Okay. Yeah, I remember the first, like, the Maestros, like, from Gibson. I guess Gibson made those. Those were, like, real early ones. I don't know if you remember those. They kind of look like a wedge of cheese. And then there was MXR, too, I think, was early into those pedals. Yeah, yeah, they came, I think the first MXRs were maybe 73 or 74, and this okay. was 70. But nevertheless, what you, whatever you just played definitely sounds very much the part. And was that also into your same Princeton right there? Yes, yeah. Yeah, it sounded great. It sounded great. And before we move on from uh, the Jackson 5, I just have a couple more questions for you, just again, selfishly as a guitar player. Um, were those sessions pretty like well charted out or like how much of that was developed versus how much of it did you kind of have to invent in the moment? Uh, it wasn't charted out for the guitar players. Uh, we only had a chord chart was all we had. And we'd just work up those parts in the room together to figure out what each of us would play that that would work with what the other guy was playing. We usually had three guitar players on on the Motown sessions. Yeah, I've heard that and, about yeah. about those sessions. And would you say that uh, like was was it how much of the the work was overdubs versus playing with the other guys like throughout the whole entirety of the session? Uh usually the 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 basic track, the drums, keyboards, guitars, and bass, uh, at the end of the session, we would have that track with all of those instruments playing at the same time. It was very rarely that we would have to do any overdubs separate in those days on Motown. Uh, they they liked to get that take. Uh, session was three hours long. And they wanted us to get three tracks in three hours. So we'd work up one tune and, and record it in the first hour and go on to the next. Um, and, and then from there, they would do the strings and horns and all the other overdubs later. But the, but they had that whole basic track as soon as we finished that that take. And did you get to meet like a young Michael Jackson at that point or were they not at the session? They weren't at the session, but the one time I had to go down and do a, an overdub because on I Want You Back, there were certain parts they wanted repeated again that we didn't yep. do on the live date. So I went down to do that. That was the first time I got to see Michael Jackson 
And remember, he was 11 years old. Yeah. And he was in there doing his vocal on I Want You Back. Yeah. And, and it, was, it, was a, <laughs> it, it was something to see. Uh, he was incredible, you know, at, yeah, at 11 years old. Yeah, I bet. I mean, I well, mean, certainly, you know, he had one of the most incredible music careers of all time. Um, and he just got better. You know, uh, his singing, dancing, I mean, his performing, you know. It's one, it's one, one thing to, uh, to, to be able to sing like that in a live concert, but then with all the dancing he was doing, uh, he was yeah, it's pretty amazing. incredible. Well, I want to talk to you about another group that you have become synonymous with. And, and I know when we've talked offline, you said, you know, because of the way that crediting used to work, that there was a lot of confusion around the players that played on some of these big hits that were coming from the 60s. And I'm speaking specifically about the Monkees. And you were responsible for two pretty iconic songs in the guitar tones found in them, which was Last Train to Clarksville and Valerie. So I'm wondering if we can talk about those a little bit in your work with the Monkees and the gear and the sessions. Yeah, um, with with the Last Train to Clarksville, uh, well, for one thing, that, se- that particular session and all the sessions I did with the Monkees, uh, none of the other players were well-known session players. And since none of us got credit on the album, uh, everyone suspected that it was some of the other uh, established members of the Wrecking Crew or A-list players, you know, like Tommy Tedesco or or Glenn Campbell, or they always thought it was one of them or James Burton that played on that stuff because uh, no one knew who I was. Uh, and they didn't give me album credit. So for years, no one knew who played that stuff. But um, yeah, on, on those sessions, uh, Last Train to Clarksville, we did have a little bit of a rehearsal session with, with the producers, Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart, and we worked up those parts uh, before we went into the studio and recorded them. Uh, so... Uh, uh, that's the way Last Train to Clarksville came together. And now I never, I never heard Valerie till we went into the studio. We were in the studio when Tommy p- kind of played it on the guitar. And that's when I started mucking around with that, with that stuff. I was just joking. And they said, wow, you know, that's pretty amazing. P- go ahead and play that, you know. So it ended up going on the record, uh, but that was totally just uh, a freaky thing that happened. Um, and I've I've had had a lot of uh, response from that particular solo, you know, or whatever whatever you want to call it, that little outburst of overplaying. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and they were pretty close together because I think you I think that at least when it was released you maybe did it much before that, but 1966 for uh Last Train to Clarksville and then 67 for Valerie. Were the sessions a lot earlier than the releases of those or did they, did it feel like those are kind of back to back? They're pretty close together because uh, uh all of that monkey stuff was happening uh pretty quickly. You know, so uh, they needed they needed another a single pretty quick. So uh, I don't remember exactly what the time span was, but uh, it was uh, all uh, it seemed like overnight. And know? do you remember for that what kind of gear you were using to kind of get the those signature sounds for those two songs? Uh, well, that was a that was the first. Uh, my first hit record that I played on, and I had come straight from the clubs, so I had a big super reverb that I played on that, and a Telecaster. Do you remember what year the Telecaster was? Was it a 50s or a 60s one? It was about a 64. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. In maple neck yeah. or, or maple fretboard or a rosewood fretboard, do you remember? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember. Uh, I'd have to look at a photo to see. But it was a great guitar. Uh, I used it in Las Vegas 
on a show where we were playing everything from jazz to rock and roll and blues, and, and it, it just worked for everything. Uh, so the, the back pickup on Last Train to Clarksville, you know, really, really cuts through like a bell. Yeah, it, and same for Valerie, was that also that same guitar? Yes, uh huh. And, and also the Super Reverb at that time? Uh, probably. All right. Probably so. Well, I'm wondering if uh, you might be willing to play a little bit of those two songs for us so that we can hear, uh, you know, kind of how you approached it. And for people that are listening to this for the first time, they're in for a real treat. I'll play a little bit of The Last Train to Clarksville. Uh, I'll do the intro and then the solo bit. Okay. Uh, that, that's two of the main guitar parts. Okay, perfect. So we'll see, see if we can uh, make that happen. Gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. And the Valerie, uh, it's a bit of a stretch for me to play that because I was much younger when I played that thing. I'll, I'll try a little bit of it. such a such a cool idea like at that time taking like kind of like a flamenco sort of approach and putting that on like a on a monkey song you know like for what would have been contemporary like there is probably nobody else that was doing that or even had a thought to do that well i i used to listen to all kinds of 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 guitar players uh ma mainly guitar players and uh, by that i mean classical blues jazz and flamenco, and I had some Carlos Montoya flamenco and Sabicas, and uh, I used to play around with that. And when I heard that chord progression, it sounded like a Spanish chord progression to me. So uh, as a joke, I started doing that flamenco stuff, and that led to me playing that on the, uh, on the record. Did they know that they wanted that? Did they say like, Louie, we want you to do that flamenco thing? Or did you just bring that to the session and they're like, that's it? No, I, I just started doing it as a joke and thinking, you know, yeah. I was just being a smart ass. And, and they, said, <laughs> they uh, said, no, no, keep it. That sounds great. Let's do it, you know. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, man, that, that must have been such a cool just uh, experience because that, that really kind of, you know, set the stage for what became this incredible career of yours and being, you know, part of the wrecking crew and all that. Did you have any sense that that was the direction that things were going when you kind of, uh, ex you know, took those sessions on for the monkeys? Oh, well, I mean, I was just thrilled. Uh, yeah, that was a very hard click to get into. And so that was, I was thrilled that that was my ticket to get into the session scene. But on that particular tune, I later felt bad that Mike Nesmus was going to have to try to to fake that, you know. <laughs> You're right, right, right. It never even dawned on me when I was doing it, you know. That's right. Uh, That's right. But uh, I, I caught up with him uh, a couple of years before he passed away, and we 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 shared some good memories together, and ha had a great time when they came here to uh, Australia. I joined him on stage and played Last Train to Clarksville with him. 
That's great. And we all went out to dinner and hung out and had had some shared some great memories. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Well, man, that's that's such a cool that's such a cool story, and and yeah, that stuff with the monkeys is absolutely incredible. But uh, I want to talk about another amazing session of just we could we could be having this conversation for days, and we would still not run out of songs. So we did have to pare it down some. But this next one is is one of my favorite all time songs, and you know just the fact that you played on it, it's such an honor to be talking to you about it. Which is from the great Boz Skaggs in the song. Lowdown in 1976. How did you get that call from Boz? How did that session come to be and that iconic guitar part in it? I got a call from David Page, uh, and the, uh, I knew David since he was a kid. Well, since he was in high school, uh, he he did a lot of work with us on with Seals and Crofts. He and he and Jeff Picaro and David Hungate. So I got a call from David that he was going to produce this artist, uh, well, uh, Boz Gags, And uh, I'd heard I'd heard of Boz. Boz was from uh, up in Northern California. Uh, so I got the call to do the session. And uh, it was one of the most fun sessions that I ever did because uh, it was a great little band. Basically, it was Toto without Steve Lukather. Yeah, and with Boss Gags giving you a great vocal, uh, so it was uh, the tunes just played themselves, you know, because we had a chord chart and we'd count it off, and everyone just sort of uh, played off each other, you know. Wow, and wow! Like I say, it was just a really enjoyable session with those with those great musicians, those great young musicians at the time. Uh, and I mean the tone on that is pretty iconic. There's kind of that that fuzzy lead tone um, that uh, is just so iconic in that song. What did you use to get that sound? It was some uh, again. It was just some sort of a fuzz fuzz pedal. Uh, okay. And uh, I, I remember I didn't have a pedal board. I just plugged the guitar into a. a uh, uh, the fuzz pedal with a battery didn't even have a power supply. Yep. Straight into the amp. And okay. By that time, I had the little Princeton. Yep. Okay. And uh, so that's what I uh, I played through on that. And do you remember what guitar you used for it? Uh, it was either a Tele or at the time I had a Gibson L5 solid body, which I played a lot. Uh, it could it could have been that one. I think I had a red uh, L5 solid body. Uh, a Boz later got one. Yeah, could have been that one. They're so great sounding. Well, man, I'm wondering if I can convince you to play a little bit uh, of that. I know you got a you got a track uh, ready to go, and I, I love to hear uh, you know you, you uh, reinterpret "Lowdown" for us. Okay, here we go. It's a fun tune to play. Yeah. What did you use right there for that that lead tone? Uh, it's still just clicking the big muff on. Just the big muff <laughs> again. It does the trick. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh -huh. and, I have a little pedal board that I use for most of my gigs. It just has a tube screamer, a big muff, a chorus, a delay, a reverb, and a tuner. Perfect. Uh, so, yeah, that's my travel my travel kit. 
And do you take that Princeton on the road with you as well, or do you have just like a substitute that you'll take in its place? Uh, yeah, I never take the Princeton out of the studio. Uh, I'll use a Blues Junior, but someone made me a copy of the Princeton also okay. that I can use. Uh, they 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 copied the circuit and everything, and so it sounds just like this one, except it's new. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, I'm absolutely in love with with that Boz Skag song, and that's such a great part. I'm I'm so appreciative for uh, you know th those ideas that you came up with, and as you said, it was just musicians in a room coming up with some great ideas together. And it sounds like uh, you know your intuitions there uh, led to just a massive hit for Boz Skaggs and still uh, played you know ubiquitously to this day. Yeah, some of those tunes, you know, they sound as good today, you know. Uh, if not better. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, I want to go backwards just a few years to another song that we actually had interviewed uh, another session guitarist, Tim May, who played on this song with you, the song Hello by Lionel Richie. And he had said that the credits were, were, were reversed and that it gave him the credit for the solo and you the credit for the rhythm guitar playing. But he said, actually, you were the soloist uh, and he was playing the rhythm guitar, and and he's like, yeah, I just wanted to come up with something, you know, as cool as Louis. So uh, and so, I think he was glad that you were there, and he uh, he definitely had a lot of kind words to say about you and and your and your guitar playing and your professionalism, and and so it'll be cool to talk to you about this song and get it from another session guitar uh, guitar player's perspective because we heard it from Tim, but now we want to hear it from you. What was that Lionel Richie session like? Was this an overdub? Was this live in the room? How how was it for for you on Lionel Richie's "Hello"? Actually, that was an overdub. Uh, and wh when when Lionel did the uh, when they cut the track, and it came to the solo, Lionel hummed a solo that he wanted the guitar to play, and. Uh, they tried several guitar players to play that solo, and they weren't happy with it. And so I got a call that they wanted me to come in and do that solo, and they want me to learn that. They sent me a cassette with Lionel humming a solo, which I learned. And I go down and, and, and I, I record that solo. It was just me and the engineer there. Lionel wasn't there yet. And... Uh, I didn't like the way the solo sounded, so I said, if you've got another track, let me give you another option. And so he rolled the tape, and the next thing I played was what came on the record. Wow. Uh, Lionel heard it, and he just loved it. Wow. So that's the way that solo happened. It's really a master class in sort of building a solo because it, it, it has kind of like these humble beginnings and then it starts to build up it gets the 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 octaves start to come in and it and it just kind of widens to this beautiful crescendo uh and it's it's just so well built uh the solo is really really gorgeous i'm wondering if i can convince you to play a little bit to, of of that solo for us we'll give it a shot all right let's see such a great solo louis oh my god it's so great yeah well, yeah we got lucky with that one you just seem to get lucky all the time though <laughs> you always came up with the, the man it's it's uh but you know it was it was great working with lionel he was he was so appreciative of of everything you played uh i did quite a few sessions with him uh on on other things we did deep river woman and stuck on you and some of the others uh and he he just uh he loved everything you played you know 
Yeah, he he seemed to have a very limited group of guitarists that he would work with. It was like you, Tim May, and Carlos Rios were the only people he really used for anything. Yeah. So he seemed to have like a very tight-knit group of people that he would call for guitar stuff because you guys pretty much dominate every credit, sometimes on multiple songs or on the same song you'll find Mm -hmm. you guys on them. Um, So I think that speaks to just how highly he must have... uh, must have and still does think of of you and and uh, your intuitions as a musician. Yeah, he he's a great musician himself and a great writer. That's that's what I understand. Yeah. Tim May had said that you know he would just be in there and he'd be playing the Rhodes or the piano and would would just be you know singing his butt off right there in the session, just in in you know just yeah. sort of scratch vocals. Yeah, very talented guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well. Right around that time, you also did a, a mega hit that was Joe Cocker and uh, Jennifer Warrens, and it is Up Where We Belong from the uh, major motion picture, uh, an Officer and a Gentleman with Richard Gere. Can you tell me about that session? Was that, you know, with, with Joe Cocker in the room? Was that overdubs? Was that, how, how did that come about? Uh well, the band was uh, myself, uh, Mitch Holder, also on guitar. Okay. Uh, Abe Laboreal on bass, mm-hmm. and Dugu, a drummer who I'd never worked with before. He was fantastic. So we, we did the session. I think it was a 7, seven o'clock, 7 p.m. session. And uh, we kept waiting for Joe Cocker to show up. Uh and uh, the, 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 this was back in the days when he's, he was still a bad boy. Okay. Uh, he didn't show up till 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so we cut the track without him, uh, and then they did their vocals later. Uh, interesting story, though, you know, uh, Joe Cocker, before he passed away, he had reached uh, a certain stage in his life where the 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 thing he was most proud of was was the tomatoes that he was growing in his garden. <laughs> 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 he went from a bad guy to a a gardener. <laughs> wow. Well, maybe that was his his meditation. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll play a little bit of that one for you. So good. Well, I mean, and you, you, you brought all the just the those perfect, you know, double stops and 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 just the a beautiful use of you know triads and and uh, just so tasteful and just put in the exact right place. You know, that's that's the hardest thing to do. Yeah, that that's that style works on so many records. It's simple, but uh, uh, I never got into trouble playing those kind of things. Where do you feel like that sort of sensibility, you know, where do you feel like you really kind of absorb that? Because it's certainly an R&B style of guitar playing. Did you feel like that was like kind of always something that, you know, you you kind of took with you from being a young guitar player? Is that something you kind of developed as you, you know, started to, you know, work in more sessions and, and, and work professionally? Well, g- growing up in the South, I was exposed to so many uh, different kinds of music, you know. Uh, so, and I listened to guys like Steve Cropper uh, and, and those kind of guys. Uh, and I, I learned from all of them. Uh, as I say, I stole from the best. <laughs> and uh, I just had a, I guess I had a good sense of where that stuff works and when to use it or what style to play depending on the song, you know? Because I grew up with country and then went through the rock and roll and the jazz and the R&B and the blues, years in the clubs, you know, that's where you you work up those chops and, and that 
you know, uh, the mental part of it. And, and being from Arkansas, were you close to the Memphis side of, of Arkansas or were you more uh, to one's, one? Well, Little Rock's right, right in the middle and Memphis is halfway, yeah, Memphis is halfway between Little Rock and Nashville. Uh, but uh, I, I, we would get musicians from Memphis that would come and hang around in Little Rock, like Reggie Young, the famous guitar player that played on a lot of so many hits. Uh, uh, when I was 16, uh, I was playing around Little Rock with Reggie, and he, he taught me a lot, and he's the one that told me about guys like Barney Kessel and, and, and Johnny Smith, who got my interest into those kind of players. Uh, so we, so we uh, were exposed to a lot of, of good music with those Memphis players. Yeah. In going back to Up Where We Belong, do you remember what you used? Was it this the standard Princeton amplifier for that? Yeah, it would have been. I, I just used that on everything once, once I started using it. Uh, and what about for guitars? Um, that could have been the strap that's in the the Musicians Hall of Fame. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, yeah. I, I used that on most of those hits. I used it on Hello. I know. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. And, and was there, were you using many pedals as you kind of got into the 80s, as pedals became more predominant in, in the studio? I never was the big pedal guy, uh, yeah. but I, I had a few, you know, main, mainly the, you know, the chorus and the uh, delay and, and uh, overdrive. Uh -huh. uh, was this like the big rolling chorus, like the stereo chorus box? Oh, I had, I had, I had all of that. I had all the Mutron stuff. Uh, I, I didn't use a lot of it, uh, but, but I, I had it just to try it out. I've got quite a few now that, that again, I never use. <laughs> I, I got four shelves over there full of them. Well, it seems like you didn't need them. You, you, you could produce all the tone that you needed for your, your biggest songs with, uh, with the guitar and, and your trusty Princeton. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't use a lot of effects, really. Uh, yeah. Now, um, I want to go back in time a little bit and and talk about your work with the Carpenters, and you'd work with them a lot over the years. Uh, it was definitely one of the bands that you seem to have a, a lot of credits on. And there's one song in particular that I really love uh, that you were involved with that, that was written by by Burt Bacharach, which is uh, Close to You. And I think that that came out around 1970 or so, although presumably recorded earlier than that. Yeah. Can, what can you tell me about what it was like working with the Carpenters? You had mentioned to me before we started recording that you know you had met them before they even had a record deal. Yes. Uh, one of the first people I met when I went to L.A. in, in 63 was Joe Osborne, uh, who uh, eventually played bass on so many hits, played on all their stuff. And Joe was friends with the Carpenters. Uh, and they were just young teenagers, and uh, he invited me over to his uh, little garage studio where we recorded some some demos with Karen and Richard Carpenter. And uh, I don't remember what they were and, and if those were the ones that got him their record deal, but that was the first time I met them. And then, uh, of course, uh, once they got their record deal, they let us play on their records, uh, which was a pleasure because Richard was very talented, but Karen was such a great singer, she would give us a guide vocal, and that could have been the master on everything she sang. She never sang one wrong note. And it's it's tough to keep time, too, on the drums if you're singing. Now, did she do that stuff live at all, or was that over? No, that... Uh, no, that was Hal okay. Blaine on drums okay. all the time okay. on the sessions. Yeah. So just w when they yeah. would perform it live, though, presumably she would be the drummer. Yeah, yeah. She was a great drummer, really. Yeah. And when we did the demos, she played drums. That's great. That's great. And was this? This yeah. was probably 
still your Princeton since it was, you know, late 60s, early 70s when it was recorded? Yeah. Do you remember what guitar you used oh, on yeah. for uh, Close to You? I really don't. Uh, the, 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 I, I, I didn't keep any notes. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it would have been one of, one of those, you know, telly. Uh, but uh, would you be willing to play a little bit uh, of it for us? Okay. I'll see if I can remember it. <laughs> okay. a great song Bert Backrack yeah I mean Bert, Bert Backrack you know I, I'm, I'm learning all the time that all these songs that I, I didn't even have any idea that were his but I uh, songs I love turned out that he he wrote them so he was such a prolific writer and uh, and you know just the fact that the the Carpenters you know did 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 some beautiful justice with the, their interpretation it's a it's a wonderful song and, and uh, certainly your your rhythm guitar playing and fills are just you know, again, it's that same sort of comping style that you do that is just, just as you said, works with so many things. Yeah, I look, I look for the places to play a little fill without tr getting too busy. Yeah, it's, it's, it. Your, your restraint in, in just understanding of where to come in is just, it's something that uh, is, is really difficult to do. <laughs> as a, you know, you think that a less experienced guitar player would be able to play less, and it turns out that's the Harder thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get in trouble. You get in trouble uh, if you play too much in in the in the studio. Can you ever yeah. remember a story of a time when you were a, a young session musician where you kind of got humbled during a, a a recording session as a consequence of overplaying or anything like that? Uh, not overplaying, but uh, when I first started. I, I'd get a little, a little excited and play a little ahead of the beat, which guitar players are known to do anyway. And Hal Blaine uh, took me aside and said, man, I love your playing, but uh, remember, the drummer is God. You know, <laughs> he said, you're playing just a little bit ahead of the beat, which makes it sound like I'm playing late. So just listen to yeah. the drums. And from that point on, I became what they call a pocket player. I really listened to the drummer, you know. Yeah, and there were no click tracks back then, so, so the drummer really was God in that regard. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember when click tracks first started kind of coming into fashion? Was that a big adjustment for session players generally? It, it wasn't because uh, those of us who also did film work, they already had... We are we're always ready playing to clicks. Okay. For a lot of the the calls on the movies, um, so I, I remember certain drummers didn't like it. Yeah. And uh, I did a session with uh, Hol Feliciano. Yeah. We did a session with him one time. It was me, John Guerin, uh, Paul Jackson Jr., and and, and someone else. And Barry Gordy was producing, and uh, so so we run the tune down, and we had this click playing in our ear, but Jose wasn't playing with it at all. <laughs> he he would get way ahead of it, and, and we 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 ran it down twice without saying anything, <laughs> and and then and the third time we're about ready to record, and and John Guerin, the drummer, says, uh, "Oh." Uh, what about the click, uh, Barry? What about what? Uh, and Jose said, "Oh yeah, take that thing out of my ears. It keeps slowing down." <laughs> That's a true story. I mean, <laughs> That's pretty <it's>, funny. <laughs> so he 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 didn't love the click track. Right. Yeah. Well, it, now the drummers that could that could really hold it. Yeah. Hold the hold the tempo. They, they loved the click track because. That way, you couldn't argue with yeah. them that that they slowed down or sped yeah. up because they're they're playing to the click track. 
Yeah. Well, so many of those huge rock and roll records, you know, are, are several BPM ahead at the end than where, where they started. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you listen to any record that, that wasn't cut to a click track, and if you try to grit it, uh, you'll find that it's, they all speed up and slow down, and, and for the good of the song a lot of times, you know. You might want the chorus to get a little bit brighter, you know. So it's, it's probably a more natural way to record. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I have two more songs for you, Louie, that I want to talk about. And, and I'm, I'm so grateful that you, that you are, are being really patient as I explore all these with you, because as I said, there's so many songs to choose from throughout your career that it's hard to narrow it down to just a few. This is why I think this is the most songs that we've actually ever done in any of our interviews. So again, thank you for your patience and willingness to, to do all this homework. The, the next song is a Seals and Croft song, and it's Diamond Girl. And I know that you've played a lot with them as well, um, but this one's got some, some nice guitar work on it. came out in 1976. Uh, what do you remember, or do you have any cool s stories about them or working with them in, in, in the gear that you might have used on, on this particular song? Well, we, we were in a band together before... They were Sills and Crofts. We were playing the clubs in L.A. together before they were Sills and Crofts and before I was a session player. Um, but once they, once they uh, started, once they became Sills and Crofts and I had the opportunity to produce them, uh, I, I have great memories of that. And this two of the greatest musicians I ever worked with and a great writer. Uh, on Diamond Girl, I have the little Princeton in the control room cranked up a little bit, and I think I played a 335 on that um, for that solo. Uh, and that was one of my favorite records I ever made with them. We did Summer Breeze and We May Never Pass This Way Again and Hummingbird. Uh, he was such a great lyricist and, and, and great with melodies. Uh, but I'll try to play a little bit of the Diamond Girl thing for you. It's such a, a great song. Love the the bluesy solo and just love that you, that you got to stretch out a little bit on that one. Yes, yes. Uh, we were getting ready to do their second album and Jimmy said, I don't I don't have any songs, you know. And, and in those days, we didn't have the computer. He would keep these notes of songs he had started in his guitar case. He'd take his guitar out and there'd be all these he said, I got this one, and he played a little bit of Diamond Girl. I said, Jimmy, that's a great song, man. You got to finish that one. Yeah. And and he did. It became one of their biggest singles. Yeah. Yeah, well, in, in uh, Summer Breeze, I think it was, it was that the same record as Summer Breeze? No, Summer Breeze was their, their first album that we did. For, yeah. Diamond Girl was the title tune for their uh, the second album that we did. Well, the the last song that I want to talk to you about was a, another icon, uh, the great Neil Diamond, and a song where you are are featured as a as a guitarist uh, is the song "Play Me." And uh, firstly, what is it like to work with uh, Neil Diamond, and uh, what can you tell us about that session? Well, those were the very early days for Neil. Uh, he was almost a little bit shy back when he first started. And uh, what the way he worked is he would book us for like two weeks to do an album, and he would kind of write the album in the studio. 
he would have uh, par parts of songs that he had started, but he didn't quite know how to finish them and wrap them up. So it was me and Hal Blaine, Richie Bennett, uh, I forget who the other musicians were, but uh, we, we would do a lot of uh, uh, just running the tunes and kind of almost co-writing, but we didn't, we didn't feel we were co-writing. We were just helping to finish the song. Uh, but it was, it was different working with Neil uh, and that uh, most of the other people, they would have their song finished when we came in to record it. And, and then they'd show us the song. But with Neil, he'd have it half finished and we'd have to sort of finish it in there. But such a nice guy to work with and we didn't mind working that way at all. Uh, and a lot of good tunes came out of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And and do you remember what you used on, on, on that record? Uh, was it kind of the same stuff or did it change from song to song? Um. As a matter of fact, I think I played a, a gut string guitar on that solo. Uh, yeah, which which I'm not set up to do now, but uh, I can play it on. Yeah, this. we can still get a sense on on your Telecaster of of what what you did. Was it mostly acoustic that you were playing on that record, or was there electric as well? Uh, oh no, no, it was just on that solo. Okay, but uh, I I did a lot of acoustic on that record. Yeah, on, on, I mean, on a lot of his songs. Uh, a, a mostly nylon string, or did it just vary depending on the song, whether it was uh, a steel string? Both, uh, probably mostly steel string. Okay. It's just on that solo I did uh, a nylon string. Do you remember what, what type of nylon string that it was? I, I don't remember the brand of the guitar. It was a classical guitar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, though. No, no sweat, no sweat. Well, yeah. I'd love for you to play a little bit uh, of it for us if you if you have the uh, the track handy. Okay, I'll do that. I am the moon. You are the words. I am the tune. Play me. And that, those are just some incredible songs that you have worked on, Louis. And, and again, I'm just so grateful that you have been willing to spend so much time and do this remotely with you being in Australia and us being here in America and uh, just taking us through your career and, and, and playing all these songs. You know, like a lot of these you haven't been playing since the 60s, you know. And so uh, thank you for doing all that homework and, and uh the tracks and all of it. Uh, I'm just so grateful to uh, to be talking to you. Well, I'm I'm just glad I can still do it. You know, at my old age. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you do it all right. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, before I let you go and mm -hmm. we complete the interview, there is one thing that I try to do in every interview with session greats like you is show you a few photos from the past. And have you talk about the what was going on in those photos, the context of the photos, and, and I have a few that I've I've sent to you, and I'm wondering if we can look at them together and uh, and maybe have you recall what was going on in that particular uh, picture. And the first one it should be one with you and your Telecaster, Louis. It looks like a a very young Louis Shelton, if that's what you're looking at in black and white. Yeah, that that's the '64 telly. That's the '64 telly. All right. And, yeah. And, and do you remember when that was taken or where that was taken? I think think that's probably a monkey's session. Okay. Could be. Could be the Clarksville sessions. Wow. And how old do you think you were there? I believe I was about twenty-five. 
20, yeah. yeah, about 25 probably. So this is right before things really took off for you. Yeah, this is this was around the time when, when the session scene opened up for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was, so that must have been uh, really exciting for you. It was because I had dreamed of 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 getting into that clique, you know. Glenn Campbell was a good friend of mine, and um, he, uh, he he when he first went out there, he he was a session player for a couple of years. So I wanted to kind of follow in his footsteps. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, uh, I I really wanted that yeah. gig. It's the best gig in the world for a musician. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be part of the wrecking crew, it's uh, rarefied air for sure. Yes, it is. So, so speaking of Glenn Campbell, the next photo that you should see there, if you slide over, should be with you and the great Glenn Campbell. Yeah, that's when he had his TV show. I okay. did his TV show with him for two years. Uh, uh, the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, where he would often play an ovation. Yeah, he gave me his his ovation because he he had a whole locker full of them. He endorsed uh, ovation, and uh, so he gave me his ovation. So, what uh, was what was it like to do a session with Glenn Campbell or to to work with him? Uh, you know, he's also a a favorite guitar player of mine, and and I, I'm a huge fan of his. And you know, I wish I had had an opportunity. To interview him while he was still with us, but uh, what could any any anything you could tell us about what it's like to work with Glenn? Well, first of all, uh, I had met Glenn. Uh, we were friends in Albuquerque before he went out to L.A. and became a superstar. Uh, we played together, and he had a band back in Albuquerque, where you know, in a club where he was just doing cover songs, and he was such a great singer and guitar player and had such a great personality uh, that uh, it was just anytime you were in the room with Glenn, you were having a good time. <laughs> uh, there was some good jokes being thrown around. Uh, he loved to play. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was it was a fun time. It really was. Yeah. yeah, he seemed to have a very effervescent personality from all, all accounts. Yeah, he did. Well, there's there's one more photo there, which is with you and and Lionel Richie, and I think that that's the Strat that was uh, that you had mentioned earlier in the interview, the iconic Strat. Uh, what can you tell us about that photo? Uh, do you remember where where or when that was taken? That was probably for the Hellos uh, doing the solo on Hello uh, at United Western or Ocean Way on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, I recognize that console. And 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 that uh, was the I, guitar you used on "Hello" for the solo. Yes, yes, that's it. Wow. And was there anything special about that guitar? I mean, other than the fact that it was used on those records, was it like one that you had gone through a ton of strats to find, or was it kind of just what was available when you were looking for a strat? There, there was a lot of modifications on it. Uh, Do you remember what they were? The pickups were different. Okay. I may have had, I might have EMGs on there. Uh, the tuners were different. Uh, uh, you know, it had a mm. uh, a rosewood neck. Yeah. Uh, I mean, fretboard. Uh, it was a great playing guitar, you know, very versatile. Do you remember if it was like a real heavy guitar or a light guitar? One thing that a lot of guys report from that era is that their guitars are really heavy and it seems like now guitar players really want to emphasize light guitars, but a lot of those hit instruments were not these lightweight examples. Uh, th this was on the lighter side. Uh, yeah, I, I have some other strats, and uh, some of them are heavier, but this was a pretty light guitar. Yeah, a real player. Do you remember where you bought it? Uh, I acquired it from uh, my son-in-law, Corey Fight. Mm -hmm. Who used to work at Skip's Music? Okay, in Sacramento. In Sacramento, yeah. yeah. And uh, we did some kind of a swap or something. I don't re okay. remember exactly how it went down, but. Do you remember what year that that guitar was? Uh, no, I don't. I sure don't. Okay, no I have no idea. 
No sweat. Well, it's still a cool picture there of you in, in Lionel nonetheless. Yeah, I'm glad we 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 made that one. Yeah. Because otherwise I may have forgotten which guitar I played on. <laughs> <laughs> well, Louis, um, just thank you again for all of your time today and for going through all these songs with us and for going through these photos and, and talking about the, the context at various stages of, of your career. And uh, just thank you for your contribution to music. Uh, music is a better place because of you and your work. And uh, so many of the songs that I grew up on and that, that my parents would play for us as kids and that I listen to now as an adult and play for my own kid uh, are, are, are your ideas that, that are put to, to music. And uh, I'm just so appreciative that uh, you did all this work and, and that we can still enjoy it for years and years to come. So thank you again for allowing us to interview and for being here. Well, thanks for having me. And I look forward to catching up when I get over to Nashville. Yeah, yeah, or, or, or if I make it out to Australia. <laughs> okay, yeah, even better. <laughs> yeah. We got a room for you. All right, perfect, perfect. Well, I, I, I would, uh, I'll enjoy being out there and, and, and seeing you work and, and uh, you know, getting to hear that Princeton in person. Okay, we'll do it. All right, all right, well, thanks, Louie. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye now. <laughs> 